G at the European Commission. Uh, Massimo uh, used to be uh, to uh, to hold the different responsibility, um, particularly in the nuclear uh, sector. He, he was directorate of directorate director of directorate D uh, in the past in charge of uh, nuclear energy safety ITER uh, project. Um, they ha he had had a very long uh, uh, and successful career uh, within the Commission. He was responsible in particular for the post-Fukushima uh, nuclear stress test in, in 2018 and 12. And uh, also he took care of, uh, at that time, of uh, the new safety director, uh, the new safety uh, directive uh, that which was adopted in 2014. Uh, he holds uh, a Master of Science in Electronic Engineering at Padova University in Italy and a PhD in Informatics, Industry or Electronics. So now, uh, Massimo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eve. Good morning to everybody. Um, and thank you very much for having invited me to be here today with you. Uh, I will say a few words about uh, the role of nuclear energy and the expected changes in the energy mix. Um, I will touch on taxonomy and SMRs as well uh, during this, uh, this short intervention. So first of all, as you all know, uh, under the EU climate policy framework uh, developed uh, in line with the Paris Agreement, we have a commitment to reach climate neutrality by, by 2050. And uh, we have uh, even more, let me say in energy terms, uh, an interim target for reducing greenhouse gases by at least 55% uh, by 2030. So we are preparing for this. We are preparing the implementation of the 2030 targets, the so-called fit, fit for 55 package. And implementing this strategy will transform the EU energy sector to meet uh, indeed the climate neutrality goal. Uh, while, uh, and this I think is very important to underline, aiming to ensure security and affordability of the, of the energy supply. So in order to achieve this target, we have uh, decided to rely on a well-functioning and secure internal energy market uh, where the role of electricity is one that is going to increase uh, ever more. So uh, efforts towards decarbonization and electrification uh, are uh, key to achieving uh, the goals. So when we look at um, the member states' choices, uh, we can see that uh, those uh, EU countries that have opted to um, use nuclear energy uh, are looking to improve synergy with variable renewable energy sources and uh, in order to um, have, uh, let me say, the proper mix for, uh, for the future. So when you look at the constraints that we have on energy policy, uh, we have to underline that member states are uh, by treaty free to decide on their energy mix. Uh, and they need also to ensure their uh, energy uh, security. Um, today, uh, nuclear energy uh, represents almost half of the low carbon um, electricity generated in the EU. And as you well know, member states are split almost 50-50 on the uh, use or not of uh, nuclear energy. So when you look at the plans, uh, 10 member states plan to rely on nuclear power uh, to meet their climate targets uh, with the 2030 uh, horizon and beyond, with some of them expanding use and some of them uh, even entering the, um, uh, the generation capacity, like it is the case for Poland. 
uh, we made uh, an assessment of these longer term uh, pathways um, and uh, you will hear more uh, later on by my colleague Andreas Zucker when, uh, when you enter the um, second part of this, uh, of this morning. Um, those who continue to rely on uh, nuclear energy require that we continue to pay the utmost attention to uh, nuclear safety and keep reinforcing it according to the uh, European philosophy of continuous improvement, but also address uh, the challenges that uh, um, concern uh, long-term operation. Uh, solutions for radioactive waste management and uh, decommissioning. Now, this brings me naturally to mentioning uh, taxonomy. Uh, I think that uh, all of us uh, have followed very carefully the, um, this uh, specific discussion. In support to the Green Deal, uh, the Commission proposed to establish a taxonomy, a classification of environmentally sustainable economic activities, with a view to facilitating the channeling of green investments into these activities. This means that any investment, nuclear or not, need to show uh, that besides a contribution to achieving climate mitigation objectives, it complies with another number of criteria, and for nuclear in particular, with the do not do significant harm uh, principle. And while nuclear, it is well acknowledged to be a low carbon energy source, this second part, especially uh, the impact of uh, nuclear waste on the environment, uh, requires a further technical assessment. So we have commissioned to our uh, joint research center, our internal science making body, a report on the basis of which uh, two um, experts group uh, are now providing an opinion to the commission that will come up at a given point in time to uh, decide uh, the place of nuclear energy in the taxonomy classification. On the other side, um, I think it's important to uh, recognize that there is lots of movement, uh, not only in the uh, traditional, uh, let me say, part of the uh, nuclear generation with what I would call conventional uh, in reverted commas reactors, but there has been lately lots of interest in new smaller scale nuclear technologies. Uh, which can be linked to different energy activities, such as industrial and district heating, as well as uh, more traditional uh, electricity production. So from our side, we have decided to facilitate the dialogue between interested uh, industrial, regulatory and financial players and we will host a um, workshop on um, European SMRs in the uh, coming weeks. I think it's a very important, it's a very important point because um, the uh, SMRs can uh, be a um, important tool for those countries that uh, intend to continue to use uh, nuclear energy. For example, in uh, coupling with uh, cogeneration and uh, hydrogen uh, production. Uh, let me conclude by saying that uh, um, industrial capacity in the EU and leadership in the nuclear fuel cycle are uh, key to the European priorities in terms of energy security, decarbonization and industrial competitiveness. All this needs to be carefully accompanied by uh, deploying uh, and sustaining and developing the highest standard of nuclear safety in order to ensure the protection of the citizens and the uh, environment. Thank you very much for uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Massimo, for this um, 
interesting overview on the current situation of uh, nuclear in Europe. Um, now I will try to I would like to um, to maybe uh, open uh, to some questions. So do not hesitate to put questions uh, in the system uh, so that we can uh, pick up some of them. Uh, for, first of all, I have a question on on on, on my side. So um, is for for you, uh, Massimo. So, and you rightly mentioned the fact that uh, there are some some countries in Europe who do not uh, will not support nuclear as a, as an energy source for the future. Um, and we all know which country we are talking, uh, we we have in mind uh, when we when we mention this. Uh, and maybe what the question is, what you how you see the inf impact on the influence of those member states who do not like nuclear on the energy policy at large. And in particularly on the nuclear sector in the long term perspective, is there is there a way out? Is there is there is there a compromise solution possible? What do you think? Well, first of all, uh, let me go back to basics and uh, uh, restate what I said before, namely that uh, by treaty, member states can choose their uh, energy mix, and this translates in uh, different choices in how they want to um, put in place uh, the low carbon energy mix, which is the, the common target of, of, the, of the EU. It is true that uh, the divergences and the differences between uh, some of the member states have become more pronounced as the path um, to decarbonization uh, proceeds. Uh, and we can see this in the fact that some member states uh, have accelerated their uh, phase out or cut down policies, while others are taking additional long term commitments towards uh, the use of uh, the use of nuclear energy. Uh, so I think that uh, these are the two these are the two tendencies, and there are of course different views on uh, what and how contribute to energy security, what is and what is uh, competitive for uh, different member states, also given the different circumstances. I think consensus exists and has always existed on the uh, level of safety which is needed on the way of handling the legacy of um, nuclear energy in terms of um, waste management and uh, the commissioning. And in this sense, I think that uh, the um, regulatory framework that we have developed in the past 10 years or so, uh, to take care of this is now being uh, also tested uh, in uh, in its implementation. So I think that this is you know a little bit what divides and what unites the uh, the member states in the in the use of this form of energy, which remains controversial. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for this uh, this uh, this answer. And there is a one question coming from the floor. Um, which, which relates to taxonomy um, and the question on the the, uh, the, the more in global uh, perspective. Uh, and then we know that some countries, some other, uh, I would say, economies like uh, in the US or the UK or even uh, even Russia are also working on their own taxonomy. And uh, what would be uh, the, is there any form of coordination with them on what should be in on what should not, shouldn't be in the taxonomy? Well, you have seen um, that on the uh, more global level, also at the recent G7 that there was uh, last weekend in Cornwall, uh, there is uh, quite a bit of coordination that goes on with uh, with some of our partners. And uh, you will have also noticed that uh, even when uh, there are, let me say, some uh, differences of views in uh, uh, how can I say uh, the global world order, co order collaboration on the low carbon path is one that spans uh, throughout all the different economies. 
Now, I cannot tell you uh, whether there will be a full alignment on taxonomy. We are still developing uh, our own. As you perfectly are aware, uh, there is a discussion which is ongoing, not only on the role of nuclear, but also on the role of gas in the subsequent delegated act that uh, the Commission will have to tackle, as I said, later on this year. Uh, so I think that uh, we need we need to be first into, let me say, our domestic choices and then see how we can coordinate with the others. OK, thank you. And maybe one last question be, be, before giving the floor to, to the panel. Uh, a question on the CRM mechanism, which is uh, envisaged for Belgium to repl replace uh, the current nuclear assets. Uh, what what is uh, you, the view of uh, of DG Energy on the, on on this and uh, in the in the particularly in the context of 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 climate change and what we uh, the measure we have to implement to limit emissions? Well, I mean we will have to see uh, what will be the path of Belgium exiting from nuclear from nuclear energy and then we will come back and uh, comment on that. Thank you. OK, thank you, uh, Massimo. And now we'd like, we'd like to give uh, the floor to uh, Kisian uh, Stenhoek, will be, uh, who's, uh, Kisian is the Director of Government Affairs uh, at Urenco Limited. Uh, before be, before uh, this position, he, he was involved uh, in the UK and the Netherlands Foreign Affairs. Uh, in different uh, positions, uh, particularly non-proliferation, non uh, nuclear suppliers group, a lot of different important uh, files uh, that was uh, handled in the past. And uh, not last but not least, Kisian is also very active within Foratom. Uh, he is currently the, chair, the chairman of uh, particularly the policy framework steering group. So, and uh, this is also the reason why uh, we have a pleasure to, to now give you the floor, uh, Kisian. Thank you. Thank you, Yves. <clears throat> Thank you for your, for your kind words. Uh, it is a, an honor and a pleasure to, to be moderating uh, today's session. Um, it is a very topical issue. I think uh, you cannot open a newspaper uh, today and not find at least a few articles about climate change and the need to decarbonize our energy system. Uh, today's session is uh, is titled um, a decarbonized 2050 with or without nuclear and um, given that this event is organized uh, by Foratom, the European uh, Nuclear Industry Association, I, I, I think everyone will understand that we have a preferred answer to that question. Um, uh, as we speak, nuclear energy uh, amounts to just over 40% of uh, low carbon electricity in the EU. And uh, most studies show that it will have a significant role to play uh, to decarbonize Europe by 2050. Uh, so the question is not if we will have nuclear in 2050, but how we will get there. Uh, and today's panel includes uh, presentations from DG Energy, uh, people, representatives from the nuclear industry and uh, a leading economic consultancy. And I hope today's session will contribute to a fact-based debate about the future of nuclear energy. Um, before I um, will introduce the first presenter to you, uh, a few practical comments for everyone. Um, we have um, uh, a Q&A session after all the panelists have spoken, and I would really like to encourage, encourage all uh, attendants to, to put their questions um, uh, in, uh, preferably through the VVOX application that, uh, that is in your invite. Uh, if you don't have access to that system or if you don't know how to work it, please feel free to put your questions in the meeting chat uh, and one of the organizers will put it in the application. Um, also, the slides of all presentations will be made available after the event. So that's at least one question you don't have to ask. Um, the first presenter today uh, is Dr. Fabien Rock. He's the executive vice president of uh, Compax Lexicon and the head of their European energy practice. Uh, he's a, a recognized authority in the field of utilities regulation and electricity. Um, and he has numerous publications uh, to his name, both uh, in practitioners and academic journals. Uh, I think, uh, Fabien, you will be joined by Yves Letier. I hope I pronounced it correctly. My apologies if I don't. Uh, who is a senior economist uh, and who will present the results of the updated Pathways to 2050 
the role of nuclear in a low carbon Europe. Uh, welcome Fabien and Yves and the floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much, Christian, for the kind introduction. Um, good morning, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to present this study that we uh, conducted uh, under the sponsorship of uh, Foratom uh, on the pathways to 2050 in Europe. Um, I'll say first a few words on uh, who we are, and then I'll introduce the study. Uh, and my colleague Eve, uh, who was our lead model, uh, will share with you um, the key modeling results before I come back to conclude. So that's the plan for today's presentation. A few words on, on who we are. We are a global economics consultancy, uh, as you see, with offices um, across the world. And maybe on the next slide, uh, what we do is work with uh, a range of uh, companies, but also governments, regulators, uh, on uh, a range of market modeling, as well as regulatory and, and policy issues. Let me um, now move to the study. So the context for the study is, as we all know, uh, the trilemma of policy objectives. On the one hand side, there is a big push for decarbonization, on the other hand, it's very important to ensure security of supply and to ensure that we have affordable competitive energy in uh, Europe. So in that context, uh, we have had several research questions for that study. First, um, can a European scenario with a full decarbonized electricity mix be credible, secure, cost efficient, without a significant uh, share of nuclear. Um, second, um, essentially we all know that um, life extensions um, are one issue for the existing technologies. We also know that potential new builds is another issue uh, in Europe uh, for some countries. Uh, and the idea is very much to look at different scenarios for nuclear, both life extensions and new build, and see what would be the uh, impact. So we have to do that. Uh, if we move to the next slide, um, designed uh, a number of scenarios. Uh, we focus actually on two main uh, scenarios, a uh, low scenario, a high scenario for nuclear. I'll describe these in a minute. And then we have used our European R market model uh, to simulate what would be the impact on the power system in Europe on a number of indicators. Key indicators in terms of prices, costs, investment needs, but also uh, indicators related to environmental issues, so CO2 emissions, local uh, pollution, uh, as well as indicators related to security of supply, such as uh, reserve margins uh, and, and the, uh, the stability of, of the system. So this is uh, the outline of the study, and maybe uh, if we go next, uh, I can explain to you the, the scenarios in more details. So the first thing to say is um, we have tried to be as much as possible in line with the scenarios from the European Commission, and uh, with the scenarios from um, renowned organizations such as NSOE, the Union of European um, Transmission System Operators. So this is a chart that shows you a lot of lines, but you see that all of these lines show an increase to some extent of power demand in Europe to 2050. The only question is how much increase there will be. And you see there are two competing trends here. First, uh, there is a reducing base demand. So this is the effect of energy efficiency on the current usage of power. On the other hand, you've got new usages of power, which are growing as a result of electrification. Electrification of transport, electric vehicles, electrification of buildings for heating, um, also electrification of industry. And it's important to mention hydrogen. Uh, as part of that, you know that there is a lot of focus in Europe on, on hydrogen, which obviously will have a big impact on power demand. On the next slide, another thing that's important is to keep in mind that hydrogen, but also all of these, I would say, new sources of demand, so electric vehicles, demand-side response, heat pumps and cooling, 
represent to some extent new flexibility sources and storage sources for the power sector. I won't go into the details of the modeling and the chart, but it's very important to capture the impact of these new flexibility resources. If we move on, uh, I'll say a few words on the two nuclear scenarios. So these have been based on the four atom assumptions um, in both, uh, I would say, a pessimistic view of the world, the low um, nuclear scenario. You see two lines, whether you include or, or, or exclude the UK uh, following Brexit and uh, a high scenario. So the principle of the low scenario, it's uh, extremely conservative. Uh, it's essentially most of the existing plants close without any lifetime extensions. And there are no new plants being built. So you see that under that context, we would be left in Europe with um, a bit more than 20 gigawatts, uh, 28 gigawatts by 2050 in Europe. We will look at the implications of that in a minute. In the high scenario, we would have a combination of uh, long-term uh, life uh, extensions, um, as well as a number of additional new units, uh, which would be a mix between fourth generation and, and SMRs. Um, we haven't you know, looked at the specifics because that, that's not necessary for the modeling we have here. Um, but, but you can think of different mixes depending on the countries. So this is uh, the picture. I won't have time to go into the details, but this is uh, here for the record. You'll be able to access the presentation. So let me stop here and perhaps ask my colleague uh, Eve to comment on the modeling results. Yeah, thanks Fabien. Uh, so in the interest of time, we wanted to present uh, the, the key uh, results and, and insight of the study on the key on the three key policy objectives, so being security of supply, sustainability, and uh, and economics. Uh, so I will present the security of supply uh, results and insight, and uh, Fabien will uh, take the floor back to present the sustainability and economics uh, conclusion. Um, on the security of supply, uh, so first first thing to uh, to effectively uh, 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 mention is that in both scenarios. Uh, so to meet the 2030 and 2050 uh, decarbonization objective, uh, renewable and low carbon uh, energy would have to increase to 2050 uh, in both scenarios. Uh, with, uh, so with a high or low uh, nuclear generation shares uh, um, and increasing to a significant level. Um, so in the low scenario, uh, the modeling shows an increasing renewable capacity to above 2000 uh, gigawatts, so which is already twice more than the current installed capacity at the EU level. Uh, whereas in the high scenario, so which is uh, with um, a higher nuclear share, renewable um, uh, capacities would increase only to 8.7 uh, uh, thousand gigawatts uh, of capacity, so already much higher than existing capacity. So in terms of um, uh, growth uh, compared to current uh, renewable capacities, so that's ranging between 150% increase uh, to 190% increase in the low scenario. Now, focusing on the difference between the two scenarios, so the two scenarios being distinct on the nuclear capacity assumption as described by, by Fabian in the scenario definition, um, so we have at the EU27 level, we have a 104 gigawatt of nuclear capacity difference between the two scenarios. Adding GB uh, would add an additional 13 gigawatt of nuclear capacity difference. And we see that that uh, reduction of nuclear capacity between the high and the low scenario would be compensated by a combination of all of the other uh, existing and future technologies that would compensate for the loss of uh, generation from nuclear, uh, loss, loss of low carbon generation from nuclear, so uh, uh, met by a combination of the variable renewable energy being solar, wind onshore and wind offshore, um, as well as um, uh, met and offset by a combination of what we uh, uh, label as contro controllable capacity, um, so to, to ensure basically the same level of security of supply by 2050. So we see that the modeling results uh, show a significant decrease of solar capacity and to a lower extent onshore and offshore wind capacity, 
uh, simply because onshore wind and offshore wind capacity at some point, uh, given that they're already largely developed in the low scenario, would reach the kind of uh, economically achievable potential and solar capacity would then be, need to be further developed to effectively make sure that you've got the same level of low carbon energy in your power system. At the same time, to ensure the same level of security of, of supply, the reliable nuclear capacity would need to be uh, uh, offset by controllable capacity in the form of storage, uh, which would uh, basically uh, help to balance the system. So uh, using the excess of variable renewable energy uh, from time to time uh, and balancing the system uh, when there is a shortage. So either at, um, on a daily cycle so with uh, short-term batteries, short-term storage uh, batteries, so which would basically help uh, to balance the system on a daily level, or power to gas to power type of um, uh, long-term storages that would basically help to balance the system on a weekly basis or monthly basis. And so we can see that in the next set of slides, uh, which basically show insights as to how the uh, system could be balanced um, by 2050 with much higher share of variable renewable uh, energy. So what we can see, as um, uh, explained by Fabien um, in the description of the scenarios, so first thing that we can notice is that the demand uh, would uh, play a big role in terms of providing flexibility to the system. So that's represented by the difference between the black, black line, so which is basically the load if no flexible demand were included in the modeling, and the red line, so which is basically the result of the optimization. So once uh, demand side flexibility is uh, optimized and embedded in the modeling. So we see that basically, um, on that specific day, so demand would be effectively mainly consumed at time of excess of solar generation and at time of shortage of solar plus wind generation, uh, demand would be reduced, so providing downward flexibility to the system, so which is equivalent to upward flexibility on the supply side. An additional feature that we can notice as well is when we focus on the power to gas to power role um, in the power system, so we can see that during weeks, of shortage of wind uh, generation, seasonal storage, so in form of power to, uh, power to gas to power generation would ne be necessary to secure the system. Whereas at time of excess of wind and solar generation, as we can see there, so total generation is way above the consumption. Um, so power to gas to power would help consume uh, that additional storage so to be used in the next weeks or months. So that's the picture in winter. And so we see that in summertime, the picture is slightly different. So with slightly lower wind generation, and so that's because of the, uh, of the, of the current climate regime that we, um, that, that we use in the, in the modeling. Uh, and so and we see that with the much higher uh, solar generation compared to the winter picture. So the, the main storage requirement would be on a daily basis. Uh, so represented by the green area that we can see there. So representing the generation from uh, uh, short-term batteries, um, which basically would consume the excess of renewable and solar generation mainly uh, at times of, uh, well, during daytime, so at times of excess of uh, generation. If we now focus on the role of nuclear, so it's always better to look at the kind of more annual picture. So we see that the nuclear generation would run ma mainly base load. Uh, so in the high scenario, so basically compensating and completing the significant increase of variable renewable uh, energy in the power system, providing downward flexibility at time of excess of uh, variable renewable generation, which would occur uh, in some instances with slightly higher frequency than today, simply because with the increase of variable renewable uh, energy, you would have time uh, in which the storage capacity developed by the, by the system would not be sufficient to absorb all of the excess uh, variable renewable, so that nuclear would need to provide some downward flexibility. But for most of the time, uh, nuclear would provide base load generation and uh, secure the system, uh, especially when, uh, and so we can see during that period, when the variable renewable energy would not be sufficient to secure the system and would uh, need to rely on the long-term storages. Um, Last but not least, on the security of supply results, uh, a small focus on uh, the uh, hydrogen result as well. So as Fabien mentioned initially, so in the uh, power demand outlook, effectively one of the key assumptions with regard to the growing role of electricity would be the direct and indirect electrification, electrification sorry, of the industry. Indirect electrification, so mainly uh, through green hydrogen and all of the other type of uh, clean gases. 
uh, that would uh, need to be developed um, uh, so along the uh, the, the um, uh, decarbonization objective of the of the full economy. And so one of the key questions for the power sector is what level of uh, flexibility would the production of green hydrogen um, uh, um, uh, give to the to the power system? So in other words, uh, what would be the economics of green hydrogen in terms of ratio between uh, the electrolyzer capacity and the uh, the the capacity uh, capacity or load factor? So the total utilization of that electrolyzer uh, throughout uh, the year. Uh, so to represent that uh, level of flexibility and that potential of flexibility, uh, our modeling uses an assumption that um, flexible hydrogen would uh, would um, would uh, be designed to generate or produce hydrogen for 75% of the time. So in other words, providing 25% of flexibility to the power system and thus uh, benefiting from low marginal cost and low carbon technology generation uh, when um, uh, producing green hydrogen. So that in the in the end, green hydrogen would be produced at a lower carbon content than the average power content uh, of the power system, uh, benefiting from uh, obviously uh, the uh, uh, variable renewable low carbon technology, as well as from the base load uh, nuclear generation, uh, when effectively there is a, a shortage of uh, variable renewable generation. Um, so, in terms of uh, key results, and just to give a bit of figures on the kind of the of the key uh, um, um, findings that uh, I just presented. Um, so, what we've seen is that in the low scenario, uh, so with a lower share of nuclear generation, uh, the the energy mix would uh, rely more on yet to be proven uh, storage technologies. Uh, so storage technology is reaching around 325 gigawatts of short-term batteries, short-term storage, uh, and uh, long-term seasonal storage so in the form of power to gas to, to power. So higher by 100 gigawatt compared to uh, the high scenario. Uh, in terms of the transition towards decarbonization um, um, uh, of, the, of the power system, so the low scenario would see an increase of the thermal uh, reliance, thermal generation reliance. Uh, so seeing an increase of 2,370 tower towers of additional fossil fuel based thermal generation. Um, so between 2020 and 2050. And so we'll see that in the sustainability impact. Uh, and so that's roughly equivalent to four years of EU total power generation. So quite a significant increase of uh, thermal uh, reliance. And directly linked to the above result, uh, so uh, a low uh, nuclear generation uh, scenario would effectively increase the reliance on imported fuel as well, so mainly gas and coal. Uh, so around 4,000 tower towers, so basically twice more than the, uh, the equivalent power generation from uh, thermal generation. And so all of that would be effectively seen in the sustainability results that uh, Fabien will uh, present. Yeah, I think uh, I will be quick given that we have uh, limited time. Uh, on the next slide, very quickly, I'll touch uh, first on um, the sustainability effects, so impact on uh, emissions. What you see here is a comparison of CO2 emissions in the low nuclear scenario and the high nuclear scenario. By construction, by 2050, both scenarios um, do um, you know, emit very little CO2. That's by construction, by assumption. What's important is a transition. On the way there, uh, maintaining, extending nuclear plants and building new plants would avoid emissions in the transition by avoiding uh, to rely on thermal plants, coal and gas. And you know that for CO2, what matters is not just how much you emit in the end, but cumulatively over time, because it goes into the atmosphere, basically. Uh, so we would see a 19% um, increase in total CO2 emissions over the period 2020 to 2050 uh, in the low nuclear scenario compared to the high nuclear scenario. Let me mention on the next slide a few additional benefits from a point of view of the environmental footprint. So uh, particulates, um, nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxide, I mean, local pollution is also an issue associated with thermal generation in uh, parts of Europe in particular. This would be reduced uh, in um, the, the high nuclear scenario, of course. Uh, I could mention also the issues with land use um, and curtailment. Um, 
uh, but these are these are also uh, secondary elements to uh, to keep in mind. Let's conclude perhaps with a few points on the economists on the costs. Um, so the study is quite aggressive in assuming technology improvements. So cost reductions for wind, um, solar batteries, which are quite aggressive, as you see. Battery costs would be reduced already by 2030 by 64% compared to 2015 in our assumptions. Um, nuclear, we uh, have here a, a more, I mean, a smaller cost reduction uh, assumed 25% by 2030 and 37% uh, by 2050. What does it give us on the next slide? Well, essentially, uh, we see that uh, over the modeling horizon, so 2020 to 2050, consumer costs would be higher by close to 400 billion euros cumulatively in the low nuclear scenario. So that's about 5% uh, increase uh, in total EU consumer costs over that period, and it is indeed uh, quite significant. This is not the only economic indicator. We should also keep in mind that there is a residual value of these investments uh, by 2050, given the long lifetime of, of nuclear plants. And we should also keep in mind that there could be savings on the network and balancing costs, uh, which we have estimated as representing more than 100 billion euros. So that leads us to our conclusion. I will recapitulate just uh, a few things. Um, the, I hope, obvious conclusion from the study is that uh, maintaining, extending the life of some of the current nuclear plants and making sure we can, in those countries where this is possible, build new plants has a positive contribution, both in the short term and in the long term, to Europe's decarbonization objectives. Now, what are the key enablers to make that happen? Well, first thing, and this may be uh, surprising uh, to you, but actually the development of storage is very important for nuclear, not just for renewables, because this is what allows nuclear to produce uh, mostly base load. Uh, and similarly, uh, nuclear and hydrogen go well together, because again, that is one way in which we can have an efficient, a synergetic operation between nuclear, renewables, and storage and, and hydrogen technologies. The second key conclusion is that we need the market design and regulatory framework to evolve. We need the market design to essentially provide a long-term stable price signal for clean technologies, not just nuclear, but all clean technologies are capital intensive and we need predictability. Uh, we need to be able to invest in these capital intensive uh, infrastructures. And finally, uh, that regulatory framework needs to uh, obviously take a, a full value chain um, perspective. Um, I also can mention, obviously, the challenges for nuclear, which um, are to reduce uh, cost, obviously, um, in line with the uh, reduction of other clean technologies um, cost reductions. So I think that concludes our presentation and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Fabien and, and Eve. That was a, a fascinating uh, presentation, um, and I know that um, that Andre will will go back uh, later uh, to to draw uh, draw attention to certain certain specifics. Um, I, I have one question for you. Uh, obviously, when when you do an economic model like this and you try to to predict the future, you try to base that on rational uh, economic behavior. Uh, but I think if you look at the at the energy market, uh, there is there's also uh, politics involved and and sometimes irrational behavior. Uh, and I'm 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 leaving it to the audience to decide if if that's a separate category or if it's if it's the same. But um, have you seen anything in particular while you were doing the study uh, where you see that sort of like the irrational behavior is it makes it difficult to predict and to model? That's a very good point, um, Kisian. When we model these markets, we try to be as realistic as possible. And what we see in the short term is that markets um, are pretty rational in the short term. But in the longer term, this is where it's actually quite difficult for human beings and markets to take a long term perspective. I think it's fair to say that a lot of the investment decisions are based on a rather short term 
time horizon. Um, and this introduces a bias against some of the technologies which are long lived, capital intensive. And that's why, um, uh, to come back to our conclusions, we, we believe that for nuclear, but also for a number of other low carbon infrastructures, which are long lived, it's very important that we can correct some of these biases and, and ensure we have a market design and regulatory framework that allows to, I would say, align the efficient long term um, objective for society uh, with, uh, with investment decisions that are made. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I guess it all depends on, on people being able to, to take a long term perspective which I think is something that the nuclear industry has, has always tried to say, because obviously any decision we take today will probably not have an effect until five or 10 years uh, from now. Um, I know there are some other questions for, for you, but if you don't mind, I'd like to go with the with the other presenters and then hopefully we can address those questions during the panel later. Uh, and already, thank you very much for, for sticking around for that. Um, the second presenter uh, today is Mr. Andreas uh, Zucker um, from DG Energy and the European Commission where he worked on economic analysis, foresight and recovery. <clears throat> uh, Andreas will share with us the, the European Commission's long term perspective for the energy sector in general and the power sector in particular, uh, highlighting what the share of the nuclear sector is expected to be. Uh, he will also focus then on the impact assessment of the 2030 climate action plan. Um, as already mentioned this morning uh, by Massimo uh, Andreas, um, Nuclear energy is a political topic in Brussels, uh, both in the Council and uh, and in the Parliament. And I hope that during your presentation, uh, you can also shed some light for us on on how it is uh, to work in such a political environment uh, as as a as an analyst and how it impacts your work. Um, Andreas, the floor is yours. Andreas, yes. Uh, I'm afraid we can't hear you. Are you muted? Andreas, your microphone is muted. Well, maybe while we try to get Andreas uh, audio connected again, we can we can use some time to ask one question from our complex lexicon uh, colleagues, if that's OK. Um, one of the questions uh, and, and in your uh, in your recommendations, you came back to the need to develop uh, energy storage solutions. And, and one of the questions is is about that exactly, um, which is whether the, the increase in efficiency and capacity of energy storage devices and the charging technologies are part of your long term scenario planning and 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 how. Hi, am I yeah back on the um, so if we, we take into account the uh, the efficiency of the different storage solution, and that's one of the of the key if you feature of the long term evolution and dynamic of the of the of the power system in the sense that the net consumption of storage would effectively effectively have quite an impact on well first the development of viable renewable and low carbon technologies and second the equilibrium between uh, uh, generation and demand. Um, so we take into account um, uh, standard efficiencies for these different technologies, knowing that short term batteries have a much higher and I, I can say close to 100 percent efficiency already, um, uh, whereas uh, long term seasonal storage in the form of power to gas to power technologies uh, feature uh, a somehow lower uh, efficiency. So both taking into account the kind of the efficiency, lower efficiency of the uh, electrolysis size or the uh, 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 clean gas production side uh, and uh, the so the production of electricity uh, of uh, power 
uh, from the uh, hydrogen or the, the clean gas. So the roundup efficiency of the long-term storage is much lower than batteries and effectively is assumed to, to range between, uh, uh, so starting with a relatively low efficiency around 30% and increasing to 40 or 45% in the long term. Thank you. Um, I think we've lost uh, Andreas. So um, my suggestion is that we skip to the third presenter and then we'll come back to, to Andreas later. Um, uh, apologies for that. Um, the third uh, presenter today is Mr. Cosmin Gita, who, uh, who started his career in the US with, with Chevron and AmeriCap uh, before he became the energy advisor to the Romanian prime minister. He currently is the CEO for Nuclear Electrica and member of the WANO governing board. Uh, Mr. Gita will provide a, a country perspective on the role of nuclear energy and uh, the role it can play in, in uh, achieving our decarbonisation uh, targets. Uh, welcome, Cosmin, and um, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much. And I think this is a very fruitful and timely debate. Um, and, I, uh, and I congratulate you and uh, the rest of Foratom for, uh, for taking the time to put this debate at this time especially as Europe and the rest of the world, Romania including, is looking at solutions to decarbonize. Romania is one of the countries that is a strong nuclear uh, uh, supporter. We believe in nuclear energy and we've understood that decarbonization is not possible to be achieved in economic and technical terms without uh, nuclear energy. That is the only way in which we could uh, maintain our competitiveness as uh, as a country and and the security of uh, energy supply, which has been a very important uh, subject for for the country and has proven even more important from a resiliency standpoint during the pandemic. Um, currently, I would like to talk a little bit about Romania's plans, which include uh, include heavily nuclear electric and Chernobyl. For your benefit, Nuclear Electrica is the sole can do operator, the sole nuclear operator in Romania, and the sole can do technology operator in Europe. Uh, we supply around 20% of Romania's energy needs uh, through our two units at the Chernavoda site, and we have a complete fuel cycle in country. Um, Romania, through its uh, integrated uh, energy plan, is looking to retire around 1,000. 260 megawatts of coal by 2030. And it will probably uh, compensate this and a lot of the local thermal plants uh, that are currently powering cities with um, gas, nuclear, and renewables, uh, according to this plan. So we're all on an aggressive timeline to operate and, and, uh, and commit to uh, starting um, our nuclear plan and to finalizing our nuclear plan development plan by 2030. And what does this mean? Um, uh, basically, at the Chernobyl site, we are committed to a life uh, extension for one of our units that has achieved uh, will in 2026 will achieve 30 years of operation. Uh, unit one. Uh, it is the uh, largest investment project to be developed exclusively by Nuclear Electrica, evaluated between 1.2 and 1.5 billion euros, which will be financed uh, from its own and external sources in due collaboration with, uh, with companies specialized in this type of uh, technology. Um, at the same time, um, we are looking to develop um, our legacy projects or new builds um, we're committed still to uh, to can do. Uh, one of the reasons being the fact that um, we are on this aggressive path by 2030. We're looking to see mature technologies in the small modular reactor landscape. We feel very confident that they can be deployed by 2030 uh, after 2030 with the existing regulations um views perspective and um and, um, and and barriers to entry um but we're we're committed uh, to that after we finish our our uh, nuclear project because we do see uh the need for more electricity in the grid after uh 2030 
So in this sense, um, as you know, the global nuclear production is expected to decrease. Um, so the SMR will have a very good spot in this sense. Um, we see the, the role of SMRs as being critical for thermal, uh, thermal heating, uh, district heating, and hydrogen production uh, to help uh, balance our, uh, our gas uh, needs um, and industrial needs in, uh, in, in Romania. And as that, we have studied, we have launched at the beginning of this year, a study in joint collaboration with USTDA, as Romania has signed an intergovernmental agreement between, with, with the US for development of its uh, nuclear capacity. And it's also entered in a, in a memorandum with, uh, uh, with France and has a historic collaboration with Canada. So it's a multi, uh, with Canada and Italy. So it is a multi uh, flag uh, project that draws on a lot of experience and it's very exciting. Um, but under this collaboration with the US, we have uh, signed a, a US TDA grant agreement to evaluate sites uh, that could be amenable to, uh, to small modular reactors. Um, there are small modular reactors, the ones that we were looking for, with the sites that we're looking for are te technologically neutral. Um, and from that, uh, point uh, uh, of view. We're also evaluating connections. We're seeing efficiencies uh, preliminary right now in uh, sites that are already connected to the grid. So former coal plants, former thermal plants make a very, very prime, uh, um, a very, very prime location. The other thing that uh, they they uh, offer a lot of benefit for is the fact that they're connected to the gas grids uh, as well. So if you were to couple it with hydrogen production, obviously that would be something that you know it, it could immediately lend itself to uh, to efficiencies and helping mitigate and helping achieve climate goals, uh, um, as 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 indicated in the European and national strategy. Uh, so these are very exciting projects that we're currently maturing, and uh, will definitely um, uh, that would definitely uh, support us. One of the two of the th biggest challenges that we see that we think would, the three of the biggest challenges that, that we see is basically uh, a recognition within the taxonomy for uh, for nuclear dual role. Um, as as these technologies mature, I think the nuclear will play more and more a role of a balancing factor. So hybrid systems that include uh, renewables and, and, uh, and nuclear with dual uh, electricity production can be the, the, the backbone and can of, of the grid and can also offer more opportunities for further decentralization and more market practice. So we, we definitely think that as, as, uh, as the debate goes on, um, more of the scientific facts as the, as the GR, similar to the GRC report will be made available. So, so it, it's important that we all uh, talk about the facts. We all talk about uh, the, the economic and environmental benefits. For example, in Romania, nuclear has saved up to now 150 million tons of CO2 emissions, so that that is by itself a, a, a great a great achievement uh, thus far. Um, the other thing that we definitely uh, look for is uh, creating a robust supply chain. As more and more of these technologies develop, I think it's important. And one one of the things that we've um, we've looked into um, in uh, Europe. Uh, during the pandemic and we've learned is that regardless of the technology which can be imported or you know the license differently it's, it's important that you have a robust supply chain that you can intervene uh, immediately when necessary for for the plant's operations so uh, a focus there would, would, would be would be fantastic uh, and i think we all have those but having a more common approach and more support in, in in developing that through procure, due procurement uh, legislation for uh, for nuclear and and investment in the sector would would definitely benefit a lot uh, in this sense. And secondly, is also uh, regulations. Um, at at some points, uh, it's difficult to move with these projects as fast as some of the other technologies when you have when you have to to write uh, the weight in paper. Uh, of a uh, of a spare part, uh, if you move it from one place to another, so uh, that is one one of the the, the the critical aspects that 
uh, we'll need to, to think and tackle on in the next decade to be able to achieve things as fast as some of our, um, let's say, other other sort of, uh, other colleagues in the energy uh, business and keep uh, keep up. Also, the benefit of the CANDU technology provides lends itself for uh, critical non-electric applications. So we're having that uh, in our in our in our portfolio as well. We'll start the production of cobalt sixty this decade. So helpful, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to become a supplier of critical um, medical isotopes. Um, as some of the uh, uh, some some of the uh, uh, medical uh, isotope producers in Western Europe are are ending uh, their uh, their life cycle, and uh, we've launched recently in collaboration with EBRD uh, uh, a tender to build uh, a tritium removal facility that will enhance our environmental conditions for uh, production at the at the Chernovoda site, but will become the first. European supplier of tritium, which is uh, one of the fuels uh, necessary for the ITER project, further contributing to, to the EU's resilience, the resilience plan. So for us, nuclear looks very great, looks very good. We've had a very good history given our performance, our capacity factors, our ratings in the, the IAEA, our good standing of excellence under, uh, under WANO. And uh, with due and attentive uh, operations, we can make nuclear even more environmentally friendly, create more benefits as we've shown uh, uh, previously, and uh, uh, grow its future. And, and Romania is very committed to uh, not only replacing some of the uh, retiring capacity, but growing its footprint in, in nuclear in, in the next decade. So this is a very exciting time. And I think the topic around the taxonomy and the way in which you develop these projects is, is, uh, is fortuitous, and uh, we hope it comes itself for the better. Thank you very much, Cosmin. Uh, that was a fascinating presentation. And what I liked particularly is, is sort of like your last slide, uh, uh, highlighting that nuclear energy uh, is not just relevant for electricity production, but there are also non-electricity uh, advantages, such as uh, medical. And uh, in that regard, I think it's good to draw attention to... Oh, echo, echo. Yeah. It's good to draw attention to uh, the position paper that Foratom released uh, yesterday on uh, on uh, nuclear medicine. Um, um, I, I know that the European Commission uh, has uh, has their Samira project, so it will be interesting later during the panel discussion maybe to to have a bit of an exchange uh, on on those non uh, electricity uh, applications as well. Um, Jessica, I think you have a a poll live in Vivox. So uh, for all the attendants, I would. I would ask uh, if you can if you can vote for the poll. It's it's about uh, what what Cosmin said in his presentation, the role that SMRs can play in the in the energy system, uh, and obviously it's it focused very much on uh, on on Europe. Uh, but one question for you, Cosmin: how, how do you see uh, when you when you sort of like your dream scenario? What do you think the 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 capacity of SMRs in Romania could be? Well, I'll 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 talk about. Medium term, medium term being by 2030, uh, say 20, uh, short term by 2030, medium term by 2035, 2038, and then long term. Um, in the medium term, I think whatever we have as uh, capacities that would mirror existing uh, coal facilities and uh, and thermal plants is what we need. So we have in Romania, we have the full gamut from um, uh, a thousand you know, historic 1950s type uh, coal and gas production, uh, large producing facilities. Um, so you can go for as, as much as as uh, as uh, 800 to 1000, but mostly fall into the 200 to 400 range. So I would say that this decade, um, some ex some this, those that could be in around the four or 500 range with economic efficiency, would definitely be a very good uh, support or even let's say 300 to 500. Um, and I know there's technologies that are maturing in this sense. Um, and that is purely for electricity production. Uh, if you want to expand, you could have something a little bit larger, but you're going to produce some of your electricity off grid uh, if you if you definitely have um, you know economies of scale. So that the electricity that you do not put in the grid, you can use for hydrogen production, for example, that then lends itself into the into the gas network, or why not even couple with uh, with uh, with uh, data facilities? 
so you can have nuclear play uh, into a pulse to data type of, uh, of scenario uh, with very high efficiency rates, by the way, and uh, even, even better for blockchain uh, developments, which lends itself to great economics. So th 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 these are things that are being uh, developed for 2035. Uh, 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 and obviously, this, these systems that we talk about that are a little bit more flexible would be great to be coupled with some renewables because they can they can help balance um, uh, they can help lower the cost significantly, but also um, uh, balance your your uh, your your uranium use. 2035 onwards, um, I think that uh, those uh, capacities that would be in the 50 to 100 range would would be quite popular as we're seeing more the need for decentralization and um, and operation in various cities. Uh, so to speak, um, and obviously the, the smaller ones, uh, the micro reactors uh, would be probably coming around the same uh, the same timeline for areas that are not connected to the grid uh, right now, and they can they can provide itself to be autonomous. So also for the 2035 onwards, I think it would be great if we were going to have technologies that will be able to uh, uh, recycle uh, existing nuclear waste. We've seen uh, we've seen literature about mocks, but that doesn't really solve the full the full problem. We hope that some of these advanced reactors will be able to burn probably some of the waste that we're currently producing, and that will uh, lend itself to even more economic efficiencies across uh, across the, the the whole EU. So um, in this sense, Romania is investigating a lead cool reactor at uh, at Alfred. Uh, in Pitesht uh, as part of the Alpha Consortium, and uh, we 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 hope uh, that will come to fruition very nicely because it can help uh, make a quite sustainable uh, uh, cycle between our existing generation of uh, of of, uh, of nuclear capacities and and the next ones. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, then um, hopefully we can go back to uh, Andreas, who hopefully is now connected. Andreas, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome my, back. My sincere apologies, and I must tell you that um, the fact that I could not speak had nothing to do with the, the political side of working at the European Commission. That was only due to my incapacity of handling uh, the Teams app, although we tried it yesterday and worked very well. Um, yeah. Yeah, apologies well, again. I think in uh, modern times, everyone has struggled with connections, Andrea. So uh, I, I already introduced you, so I will I will not repeat myself. Please uh, dive into your presentation. And okay, uh, can you see my floor screen? Is yours. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. So um, when you asked me about presenting um, our current uh, projections on nuclear, um, I responded that, of course, we do not have projections on nuclear as such, but I thought it would worthwhile um, to present uh, a little bit the uh, current uh, projections that are done at the European Commission for the energy system and also talk about what that could mean for nuclear. Our director, Deputy Director General has given you the context, so I'm not going to uh, stay too long on the slide, but just to understand a little bit what I'm going to show you is that during the last two years, we had the process that started with a long-term strategy that was uh, presented um, in 2018, where we showed uh, a way to climate neutrality in 2050, which was then eventually adopted by the European Union as a goal. Um, that led to the situation that um, we um, were review or we're looking into our existing energy scenarios because those actually reflect so the existing ones with these i mean um, the current legislation that was passed uh, finally in 2018 is uh, leading to greenhouse gas to a to a path um, that is not achieving greenhouse gas neutrality in 2015. But um, and therefore we were for, we were um, faced with the situation to reflect on uh, what would need to be done in the next ten years in order to get to a path which uh, reflects the more ambitious uh, aim of the Paris Agreement, which is greenhouse gas neutrality. This is something which was not there before, 
It's the so-called Fit for 55. And this Fit for 55 is an initiative which will consist of a number of uh, legislative proposals, which will come out in the uh, most of them the next month, uh, July, as you know, as you all know, and um, which uh, are, of course, addressing a number of measures uh, on uh, climate policy and energy policy. And um, we have actually uh, prepared the ground for that last year when we looked at the general feasibility of such an approach, and this was called the Climate Target Plan. There is a so-called impact assessment, which we uh, published last year, and uh, which you can actually also look at. So all the figures you will see right now can be downloaded also in, in form of Excel tables on the on the website of, of, of DG Klima. But if there is interest, I can share the link also so that it's easier to find. Um, and that gives you the latest published uh, information on uh, energy scenarios on the European level. Of course, you will uh, see two new uh, let's say, batches of scenarios from us uh, this summer. One is we are working on a new reference scenario. The reference scenario always tells you how the uh, European energy and system and, and how climate and uh, uh, transport uh, systems develop over time with the uh, under the current legislation. So this will be published uh, and then you will, of course, see impact assessments for the concrete policy proposals that we're coming up with uh, in a few weeks. So what you see here is, of course, the work that we did before. And um, just to give you a very quick idea, you will see several scenarios. I will not go into details, but um, just to prepare you about what you will see in the next weeks, of course, our scenarios are constructed around the political instruments. And we are using, let's say, two main types of instruments. One is directly um, oriented on or directly targeting uh, climate or greenhouse gas emissions, like the emissions trading system, um, so any form of carbon or pricing of uh, greenhouse gases. And then you have a number of uh, policies that explicitly support the uptake of certain technologies. And these are um, the renewable energy, but also energy efficiency, uh, for instance, but similar policies also in the transport sector. And around these two principles of either just putting prices on um, on the greenhouse gas emissions or uh, going uh, with sector-specific uh, policies, we constructed a number of scenarios, which you see here, uh, reg meaning, uh, uh, which all include elements of, of both uh, approaches, of course, but which focus more on the um, on the regulation, uh, on, the, on the sector specific policies in terms of what we call reg and more on the on the pricing of uh, carbon greenhouse gases. And that is what is called C price on the right side. And of course, we uh, went also for some balanced scenarios. And we also used to have a scenario which addresses So we you remember that um, we uh, looked at uh, at least uh, last year at 50 or 55% greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we also still have a scenario in these slides, which go for 50. Now, the consequences on the short and, and the long term. Um, the short term, on the short term, the consequence is mainly that you will see, um, so in those scenarios, um, which we did for enabling the debate, which finally led to the to the adoption of, of greenhouse gas neutrality as a goal and which uh, is preparing the ground for what is happening now. You see uh, other possible higher ranges of ambitions, uh, ambition levels than uh, the ones currently in place. You might know that we have a 32.5% um, reduction uh, increase in energy efficiency and a 32% uh, renewable energy target in the legislation, so the 2018 legislation. And here you see higher ambition levels um, that would, uh, would you know, reflect those scenarios, which is um, the consequence of taking action earlier. Um, I'm not going to stay too much on this. Um, 
the question was what the energy system would look like and what it would mean for nuclear. And I just want to make just want to show three slides in order to be to be to be concise. And the first slide tells you um, you see on the left side the current system and then the 2030 and 2050 development in different scenarios. Um, and you see that the 2050 development and even the 2030 development is at first sight not so different, um, except for the scenario called baseline, which does not meet these targets. Um, and that is indeed true. Um, you see that uh, the energy system, and this is now based on primary energy consumption, or here called gross inland consumption. Um, this um, entails a, a phase out of fossil fuels, uh, a very strong uptake of renewable energy, and in general, a, a moderate uh, um, evolution uh, of um, of um, total energy, uh, primary energy consumption. Uh, you will see a decrease until 2030 in line with our energy efficiency policies, but then also um, we talked about it, we have the tendency of uh, um, the, the need for, for hydrogen uh, production, um, of course, limits the possibilities to, um, to limit primary energy consumption to a degree. So you see we're going to, to a um, into an energy system in 2050 where uh, the um, where everything is uh, where the sources are largely decarbonized and the, the we also show that there is some non-energy use indeed for for gas and for oil. This is the this is true. This is included in gross energy because we still have a chemical industry um, and there is also some natural gas left, but uh, um, there is um, the amount of CCS leads to a, let's say, uh, greenhouse gas negative power generation sector. I mean, this is energy here, but if you would look at power generation, we would capture more CO2 than we, we produce, uh, if you look in particular due to CCS on, on bioenergy. Um, a second um, observation is that we're getting electrical. Oh, yeah, and I forget to tell you the nuclear share uh, on the gross inland consumption, my apologies. So we have something like in 2030 about 450 terawatt hours and in 2050 more, a bit more than 600 terawatt hours. But you can read that, that the, the data is published. Um, and the final energy consumption, so what is finally, how is uh, energy used? There we have a clear trend to electrification. So the world is getting more and more electric. And uh, for, from current 23% or 2015, 23%, we're going to 30% in 2030 and more around 50% in 2050. So half of the um, energy is going to be uh, consumed in the form of electricity. But as not uh, all sectors are uh, easily electrifiable, or at least we think so today, we see still a need for energy to be delivered in the form of gases or liquids. And there you see an increase in the penetration of um, either hydrogen or um, gases that are uh, produced from uh, electricity um, or, or biological or of biological origin. Um, so uh, these make up for um, another third or so roughly of the final energy demand in our uh, scenarios. Now, what does it mean for the power sector? And I mean, it's actually the same slide more or less than Fabien Hopp showed that um, in order to, mainly in order to produce all those fuels that are based on electricity, you need more electricity. And you see that the size of the of the power generation system is about to to double more than double in our in our scenarios uh mainly driven by uh wind and uh, solar energy but you also see some rather stable uh and on the long end slightly increasing nuclear share there uh, i just i just mentioned the 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 figures so that 600 terawatt hours is a bit more than 10 percent in 14% uh, actually in, uh, in 2050 of gross inland consumption. So this is um, this is this is where 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 you go in terms of uh, nuclear. Now 
the last slide and the other issue we talked about and, and, and Rabbi Arok talked about is how can we actually operate such a system? Because this system is anything but um, conventional. Um, and just showing the bars doesn't tell you how it works. And you see here one very remarkable um, uh, thing I would say, and this is the need for flexibility in such a system. While between 2050 and 2030, you compensate or you achieve this with the ramp up of battery capacities, um, toward 2050, the stability uh, the, of, of, of such an electricity system is um, partly ensured by running a fleet of electrolyzers that has the order of magnitude of the current power generation fleet. So uh, more than 500 gigawatt uh, of electrolyzers. I think the current fleet of, uh, of, of dispatchable generation is something like 800. So we're getting into the order of magnitude of what is available in electricity only uh, in terms of electrolyzers. So this is a bit in a nutshell, the, the system uh, we, are, we are going to. And um, this is the, the consequence of, a, uh, of running an energy system which is uh, fully decarbonized. And in our case, in the energy mix that results from taking into account uh, the policies um, that are in place in member states and the policies on union level, that uh, results in something like 85% renewables and 15% uh, nuclear energy. Thank you very much again for giving me the opportunity to share this uh, uh, and your event, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, that was fascinating. I also think that uh, we have uh, another poll question. Ah, Jessica is already announcing it. Uh, mostly on hydrogen. Uh, Andreas, if you don't mind, I'd like to go straight on to Andre uh, with his presentation on the uh, on the, the pathways to 2050. So we maximize the uh, the time we have in the panel discussion uh, to have a, a conversation with you and the other uh, panelists. So uh, please, everyone, while you're listening to Andre, also please uh, use the opportunity to vote on the, the hydrogen poll uh, in VFOX. Um, so, André uh, is the policy director at Fordham. Unless you want to start talking directly, André, I would like to introduce you quickly. Uh, before he joined Fordham in 2015, he, uh, he worked for 10 years uh, for Nuclear Electrica in Romania and later in Slovakia. Um, he will share with us the, uh, the views of Fordham uh, and the main takeaways on the pathways to 2050, the role of nuclear uh, in a low carbon Europe that Fabien and Yves presented uh, earlier. Uh, André, uh, welcome. And um, uh, I'm yeah. looking forward to hearing your main takeaways yeah. from the Compass Lexicon report. Thank, thank you very much, Christian. And I hope that you can hear me well and you can see the presentation. So as you said, I'm happy to um, to, to present some takeaways from, uh, from the report uh, uh, presented earlier by Fabian and Yves. Uh, and I will start with uh, maybe the, the this uh, the most illustrative uh, figure in our uh, uh, in our opinion. First of all, um, yes, we we split it, uh, and um, we we consider that is very important, uh, showing the role of uh, of a high nuclear scenario for 2050. So. Um, you can see that uh, in in the, in the left uh, chart you, uh, uh, there is the forecast of, of the decarbonization of the power system in, with the, in red, and then you 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 can see the two nuclear scenario, the low and the high nuclear scenario mentioned by uh, uh, by the compact lexicon. And what is very important, and I think that here uh, this um, this should be uh, highlighted, uh, it's about the long-term operation of the existing fleet. It's having really an impact. So uh, if we are going to operate it, um, uh, extend the lifetime of the existing fleet, uh, we will definitely uh, be more comfortable in achieving the, the targets uh, for the uh, short and medium term. While uh, for um, uh, for the low nuclear scenario, so we, if we are closing the uh, nuclear power plants, you, we can see even an increase in the short term uh, of the emissions uh, um, of the power system. And um, 
also not to, just to say that it's uh, it's very important uh, that uh, the low nuclear scenario it's uh, the path is very very close uh, to the decarbonization path and uh, uh, i would say any mistake would uh, would lead to um, to uh, exceed the uh, minimum uh, the maximum amount of uh, um, co2 what I would like to to say on the, in the right uh, hand side, it was already uh, mentioned by uh, Fabian, is very important. So um, uh, in the low nuclear scenario, we will have higher uh, emissions, which are uh, added to uh, an overall budget of uh, of uh, the CO2 emissions. It's it's important. So um, even if the targets are um, achieved by both scenarios. Uh, we still have to keep this in mind that uh, the budget uh, will increase in the low nuclear scenario uh, case. Another very important picture uh, is uh, is this one. I will not get into the details. It's about the generation outlook. Uh, what I would uh, point later on would be uh, about the fossil fuels, uh, the existence of fossil fuels uh, uh, in uh, in the different uh, nuclear scenarios, but also the the share of variable renewables. And then, um, as Compact Lexicon said, um, uh, we look at uh, at the report. Uh, um, considering three uh, sets of takeaways, I would say. First of all is the environmental sustainability. Um, the, the other uh, emissions than the CO2 uh, uh, were mentioned already. The land use is also very important. It's, uh, it's quite a, a, a significant uh, um, uh, size of the land needed to, to develop alternative uh, technologies in order to, to meet the decarbonization targets. And the size it's uh, uh, around almost 10,000 uh, kilo, uh, square kilometers, and it's uh, four times the, the size of Luxembourg. is uh, is striking the the figure. Um, something that we we also took into consideration is not uh, uh, detailed in the Compact Lexicon report. It's about the raw material usage, but because we have the generation, we can also calculate uh, what would be the oh. amount of raw materials between the uh, different scenarios and we saw that in the low nuclear scenario the the consumption of the raw materials is higher because of uh, alternative technologies that should be developed and uh, the last point is about uh, renewable curtailment uh, so basically it's uh, it's a lost uh, right. Uh, um, uh, amount of electricity and we also considered into this environmental uh, sustainability takeaways because uh, uh, it's impacting it. The second uh, set of takeaways is uh, the security of supply and uh, we consider it that is very, very, very important uh, uh, to keep it in mind. I will not go uh, into details, maybe to just to mention the, as I said earlier, uh, to keep in mind the, um, the share of variable renewables in 2050. Um, and the, the grid stability might be uh, at stake, uh, considering that uh, there are a lot of, um, there are several, I would say, studies or uh, reports uh, uh, that um, see uh, a share of uh, more than 40% of renewables uh, might uh, put the grid uh, stability at risk. And the reliance on uh, yet mature storage technologies. This is another story. It's uh, very well uh, detailed in uh, in the compact lexicon, and we consider that it's a very important uh, conclusion. And the last uh, last set of uh, I would say the conclusions, the takeaways. It's about um, uh, the economic uh, advantages brought by uh, nuclear, and. Um, um, on top of what was uh, already said, I would uh, I would look at uh, hydrogen, and because we heard a lot of uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, things lately, and uh, we we consider that hydrogen um, cannot be. I mean, the, the the ambitions of the Commission to uh, for the hydrogen economy cannot be achieved without uh, nuclear as well. So that is uh, from my side. And uh, I would be more than happy to 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 discuss during the uh, panel debate. Thank you very much, Andre. 
uh, and and thank you very much for for winning back some of our time uh, for the for the panel discussion. Uh, I think Jessica has uh, another poll ready uh, about the advantages of, um, of of nuclear. So so please everyone uh, take uh, an opportunity to vote for that. Um, so then um, I would like to invite all the panelists to to put their camera back on and and their microphones. Uh, and uh, we've got quite a few questions on on VVox, but uh, but not enough. So so please, everyone, feel free to add more questions or uh, upvote uh, questions you particularly like uh, for our uh, for our panelists. Uh, and I see for yeah, um, do we have Cosmin as well? Okay, so first question. I th I think um, it, it was asked. Sorry, I had a I had a connection problem. Uh, no worries, no worries, no worries. I I think the first question uh, in the um, in the in the poll of or in the in the VVox was for Mr. Zucker, but I think it will be interesting to hear all of your uh, perspectives on this question, which is um, when you look at the electricity system in 2050. Um, I think a lot of um, emphasis is on decarbonization currently in the debate. Um, but if you look at security of supply uh, base load, uh, how, how do you how do you see uh, that envisaged? Um, okay, so when we do the scenarios, the the modeling tool we use, which is known to some of you, the the Primes model, has been um, over the years enriched, and uh, so the results you see include a an analysis of of the electricity system so that means that security of supply is given so there is a, a dispatch there's a dispatch analysis done uh, by this overall energy system model which is of course a challenge because what we are modeling here is nothing else than the the energy balances so we model all the energy going into the economy and 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 how it is uh, how it is um, transformed and then how it comes out so um basically there is a we ensure in our in our modeling that there is um security of supply um well security of supply we Actually, at the Commission, we see two aspects in security of supply. It's also the security of supply uh, in general of the economy and the imports of currently hydrocarbons. That's also the security of supply for, uh, issue for us. And there we actually see that uh, by uh, switching from the import of hydrocarbons to the use of renewables, we are improving security of supply. So this is one aspect. The short-term security of supply is one of the reasons why you saw such an increase of electrolyzers, but also um, a, an increase of batteries to uh, about twice the uh, current installed capacity of pumped hydropower over Europe. So uh, this is how security of supply is uh, uh, ensured, but you also still see some natural gas with CCS and you see bio biomass in the uh, in the power mix. So basically there is security of supply um, is ensured uh, for the electricity system in, in, in our model. But of course it requires heavy investments in uh, storage technology. OK, thank you very much. I, I, I'd be interested to hear uh, Fabien's take on this as well, because obviously uh, the, the models are very similar, but but I think there's enough difference that it would be interesting to hear his view or or Eve. I, I see Eve coming on as the chief modeler, I think. Yep, I'm in, am I uh, yeah, on. Um, so yeah, security of supply as well is is a constraint that the modeling will try to to meet and achieve through the modeling horizon. So that it builds sufficient reliable capacity to ensure the security of supply constraints uh, that we that we use as, a, as an input. And so as per the, the primes uh, results going to 2050, uh, most of the reliable capacity would need to be low carbon. And so that would definitely be a mixture of storage technologies, short term and long term storage technologies, as well as um, as uh, as a bit of CCS biomass and and um and and nuclear obviously okay thank you uh, andre do you have uh, views 
<clears throat> well, yes, I would. Uh, I, I would say that uh, I, I think that the um, the overall um, uh, best way to to decarbonize the economy by 2050 should consider beside the decarbonization uh, as such, but uh, also uh, this security of supply is very very important. The, the security of supply aspects are very important. And I think that uh, here nuclear can make uh, very, very strong points um, from uh, from different perspectives. But also eco from the economic point of view, it's uh, it should be uh, should be uh, taken into account this dec decarbonization uh, to, to be made at, uh, as the most uh, affordable uh, costs. Um, now about uh, security of supply, I know that uh, there there are a lot of uh, discussions and uh, there are a lot of uh, reports and uh, analysis done uh, for for the current system. Well, I'm thinking now about uh, some uh, some issues. For example, the one uh, happening in January in uh, in Europe, uh, there were uh, some countries were impacted by uh, um, by um, some uh, uh, issues of the system. I mean. Those can can uh, can become more and more uh, uh, occurring more and more often. And um, as I said, as I pointed also in my presentation, the development deployment of the variable renewable uh, might uh, might uh, create a threat um, to the stability of the uh, of the networks. So. Yeah, from uh, from our uh, perspective, I think that the dispatchable uh, the dispatchable uh, sources technologies uh, are very important for the system. And of course, when we are talking about also decarbonizing the system, it's clear that nuclear uh, can make a very strong point. Thank you, thank you, and um, Cosmin, and anything to add to what others have said? Otherwise, we'll go to the next question. Um, the other, the one thing that uh, I think it's important that we we take into consideration as well is the uh, the the roles for balancing and uh, for for intermit intermittent and and um, um, and load following. So that that is one of the key roles that I think the nuclear can play until uh, commercial scale of uh, battery technology uh, or t battery technology coming up to a, to a, to a, uh, uh, commercial scale in use. Yeah, you uh, you mentioned something important that load falling. Huh? I think it's a it's 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 a a, a myth uh, that is very persistent that nuclear uh, cannot. Uh, uh, follow load. Uh, um, I, th I think a lot of people don't realize how flexible nuclear can be, uh, and um, always good to to remind people in in fora like this. So uh, the next question I have is for for Compact Lexicon. Uh, in in your study, um, to what extent did you consider the impact of SMR technology or other um, um, modern nuclear technologies uh, like molten salt or or maybe even uh, uh, fusion, even though that's always forty years away? So maybe I can start on this one. Um, essentially, uh, we we looked at the 2050 time horizon and we discussed with uh, the four atom colleagues. Um, and and to a large extent, our study is uh, agnostic as to what what are going to be the the future technologies. What what we have modeled is uh, you know scenarios which are differentiated based on installed capacity and based on costs. But then you can have a mix of uh, any uh, nuclear technology. What I mentioned is that during uh, our discussions, uh, the idea was primarily by you know 2030, 40 to focus on generation four and and SMRs uh, towards the end of the period. But but we we do recognize that uh, in the in the longer term there could be uh, a range of other uh, technology options. Um, I don't know um, if if Andre or Eve want to add anything on this. Well, maybe just on the flexibility that new nuclear uh, can provide. Effectively, we assume that, re well, regardless of the of the exact technology of the new nuclear build, they would provide flexibility to the system, uh, illustrated by the current uh, uh, 
running regime of the of the French fleet. So basically having the capability to effectively provide 80% of their installed capacity uh, within 30 minutes or, or within that time of um, uh, kind of uh, uh, timestamp. If I may, uh, Christian, uh, just to, um, to 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 add to what uh, Fabian said. Uh, so yes, uh, and to respond to the question, uh, yes, the the report is uh, is having, um, I would say, an updated situation of um, of the forecast of the SMR. So it's uh, it's considered there, not going so much into uh, into details about uh, technology, of course, but SMR as such, and um, later on after 2040 uh, uh, generation four as well. Thank you. Um, Andre, the, the next question uh, is for you, and that is very much sort of like if you if you compare the two scenarios uh, ha as presented by, by Compass Lexicon and, uh, and DG Energy, uh, ha how, how do you compare the different scenarios and the different pathways? Well, uh, we were following closely the, the scenarios of DG Energy, of course, and um, um, we um, we in the high nuclear scenario of uh, of compact lexicon we will consider a more um, optimistic scenario for for nuclear and it's uh, it's uh, really showing um, results um, i would say that uh, we are looking forward to see uh, the new scenarios mentioned by Andreas uh, that will be uh, soon uh, um, uh, soon released, and to see how uh, these uh, new uh, let's say technologies and new uh, assumptions uh, taken by the Commission will be integrated. Um, again, coming back to to hydrogen, we are talking about um, uh, very high ambitions of uh, of the Commission, and we really want to see how those ambitions will be uh, integrated, considering that, um, in our opinion, uh, those ambitions cannot be uh, done without uh, the support of low carbon hydrogen. Low carbon hydrogen meaning uh, uh, fossil plus CCS, but also uh, hydrogen produced from electricity coming uh, from low carbon sources. Of course, uh, nuclear is included. So um, there are some um, uh, some unknown uh, uh, parameters that we are looking forward, and uh, definitely uh, we will uh, we will say our uh, opinion once we have uh, news uh, uh, on the new scenarios. Thank you. Uh, it would be interesting to hear from from Andreas as well. Huh? So your comment on on hydrogen. Uh, and and whether sort of like some of the expectations are realistic on the production uh, of that hydrogen, uh, given the high ambitions that the that the Commission has. So Andreas, please. Well, about being realistic is always difficult because if you had asked somebody whether the current installed uh, renewable capacity was realistic, uh, um, yeah, though so this is and so this is difficult to answer. But uh, I think the most challenging challenging for hydrogen are uh, two things. One is getting the industry off the ground. And um, and that requires um, actually integrating an uh, energy vector into the system, uh, which is not there yet. So uh, electricity exists, natural gas exists, uh, hydrocarbons exist, markets exist, uh, investors exist. There's rules for trading, there's rules for the infrastructure, there's regulation. Hydrogen is something which is currently only happening within chemical complexes. So. There is more to be done than just um, drawing scenarios. And this is why, by the way, there will be a um, second wave of um, Fit for 55 initiatives, uh, and which will be published end of the year. And one, about, one of them is actually a package that will um, lay foundations for the possible regulation of, of hydrogen uh, market. Now, um, the where hydrogen comes from is, of course, uh, it's twofold. It's true, of course, that uh, low carbon hydrogen can play a role because the technology is there. 
And of course, you can uh, run an electrolyzer with uh, nuclear electricity. I mean, it doesn't behave differently. And there is an economic advantage, of course. I mean, there's an economic compromise between running, uh, between getting high running hours for electrolyzers, high um, full load hours for nuclear, and minimizing curtailment. And there is some kind of trade off between the three, and you try to have uh, all of them as high as possible. And that would probably give you one of the uh, co mo most cost attractive uh, energy mixes. But um, the one has not to forget one um, reason why we are talking about hydrogen. And this is simply the fact that we are aiming at in in uh, integrating an amount of renewable energy which is uh, producing electricity that at times exceeds the, the demand by a factor of two or three or even more in 2050. So uh, it's also an integration technology. It's a technology for integrating renewables into the market. And that is also a reason why there is such a focus on renewable hydrogen, because in a fully dispatchable world, you might, um, there will still be drivers for hydrogen, absolutely. Um, because you would want to decarbonize parts of industry, but the integration role that hydrogen uh, plays would be less pronounced. So uh, that means hydrogen is driven to a large extent by renewables. That's also why there is this renewable focus. But of course, <clears throat> the Commission is aware of, um, of the fact that hydrogen can also be produced uh, by other means. And uh, we, will, uh, we are working, of course, on... Um, <clears throat> respective uh, legislation uh, proposals, uh, which include nomenclature and so forth. Oh, that's an interesting one, nomenclature, uh, because I, I think you're referring to, to the color coding of hydrogen versus alternative uh, nomenclature. Is there anything you, a, 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 a hint you can give on, on what way the, the Commission uh, might go in that regard? Not, not, not really. You have to wait for um, our proposals in the third quarter. Um, but it's true that many organizations have um, have actually uh, put uh, some some color codes on on the table. Um, what you need to look at is, of course, at the policies which play a role on a European level. So uh, we, we we have policies in place for the um, for renewable energy. And you will find in the implementing act for the actually existing um, renewable energy directive, you will find a definition of uh, of green hydrogen there. Um, and uh, so, if we, we we will not define something is there well it's unlikely to define something which is not related to EU policy. Let's say it that way. Yeah, this might be a, an interesting segue uh, into looking at the results of the poll uh, on on hydrogen. So I don't know, Jessica, can you put it on the screen or Andre? Yeah. So the question was, uh, how, what type of hydrogen uh, will play the greatest role in a decarbonized future? And there were three options, uh, only renewable, only low carbon, which obviously uh, includes uh, nuclear and uh, carbon plus CCS, and then a combination of both. And I, I think the results quite overwhelming. People expect that it will be a combination of different uh, um, production uh, technologies. Um, is anyone in the panel who would like to to respond to this, or or is it is it so overwhelming obvious that uh, that you that you just uh, applaud it? Well, I could say something. I mean, I, of course, you could have an only green solution, uh, but let me be very clear: the European Commission is not proposing a hundred percent. We are sometimes asked why we're not making scenarios for a hundred percent renewable energy system. And the answer is relatively short because um, we need to respect the member states, uh, and we do respect the member states um, will to uh, right to choose the energy mix. And as the member states go for nuclear, we are not looking for that. So, and if in an energy system you have something else, you have other uh, carbon-free electricity, um, you can see that. Um, you are not. Uh, there's nothing prohibiting you from producing hydrogen from that. So, uh, as a conclusion, in the current situation, it's unlikely. I would say, as a modeler, not as a politician, policymaker, uh, that you will see 100% green hydrogen. But 
unless all member states decide to exit nuclear, then somehow, but then you would still have the question about the role of uh, blue hydrogen made from natural gas, which would have to be not something we, we might favor, but something which is also to be discussed. Yeah, well, I don't think that anyone uh, in this in this panel is uh, arguing that everyone should exit nuclear. So uh, let's yeah. let's not go down that path, uh, Andreas. Um, the next question I, th I think is, is uh, and, and Kosmin, you talked about uh, sort of like uh, from a national perspective, uh, had the, the development of nuclear. Uh, one of the questions in the poll is how you see um, sort of like the, the, the need for specific skills. Um, and have the, there's obviously a very specific Romanian uh, nuclear aspect to this, but I'd, I'd like to make the question slightly broader for the rest of the panelists as well. Uh, when you look at skills uh, towards 2050, uh, what is it we will need uh, uh, to decarbonize Europe? And uh, and obviously there's specific nuclear skills, but there are skills necessary for renewables and uh, and uh, uh, battery storage technologies as well. And will those compete with each other, or or will that be separate employment markets where where all of them can flourish, or will it become a bottleneck? But I'll start with you, Cosmin, uh, for the Romanian perspective. Well, the main the main challenge that we have um, in in the nuclear sector, if you were to look at utilities and financiers overall, is the way in which we operate our current plants. And current nuclear plants and current technologies are quite analogous, with uh, with a lot of uh, in person um, interventions. As we move and we look at the new technologies that are coming on. We're seeing increasing digitalization. Obviously, there'll still be the analogous, uh, an, a strong analogous component with regards to nuclear safety and and fuel handling and uh, and the rest. Which definitely, I think those 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 particular areas and jobs will will stay and will be prevalent for the nuclear market. Um, but uh, as we're seeing the new technologies evolve, becoming more digitalized, operators will become. Uh, more and more remote, so we will be competing with uh, nuclear nuclear operators. Maybe they'll be the same as 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 the current operators that are for remote hydro plants uh, and and others. So a lot of the, the 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 digitalization of these systems up until 2050 will create a a pool, I would say, of electrical operators that will become more and more. Um, and prevalent. Obviously, this will be needed to be coupled with cybersecurity, uh, as we're as we need to increase resiliency. So, so, so I'd say the morphing into the to the uh, uh, digital operator um, of of a nuclear power plant um, will become um, will become a more fungible job. Uh, so to speak, in in between different classes of of, of of nuclear of energy operations, as I see it, but this will be needed to be coupled very strongly with the with the with solid cybersecurity uh, capabilities, uh, both human and and technical, um, in in this regard. Thank thank you very much. Um, sorry. Fabien, you wanted to say something as well? Okay, sorry. Um, I, I must miss. Oh, there you are. Sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to comment, but um, I think on, on our side, we are economists, as you know, with Eve, and, and our view is uh, an external view on the nuclear sector. And what we see is that one of the greatest challenges is uh, the the market design and the regulation as we have highlighted before um, if we need to think the long term if we need to be able to uh, think about flexibility we need the market design um, to reflect uh, these uh, these challenges um, so we have we have worked separately from this project on a number of uh, studies highlighting how the market design can in europe evolve to provide a more stable investment framework. And I think that that's one of the big issues for the, the nuclear power sector going forward. OK, thank you. And, and anyone else who would like to comment? No, OK, um, I, I suggest we go to, to the results of the next poll. 
Uh, Jessica, can you put up the results of the SMR poll, please? Um, so I see them. Oh, there we are. So the question uh, after Cosmin's uh, presentation was uh, how people in the audience see the role of, of SMR. Um, and uh, it seems that the the, uh, the the moderate and high scenarios seem to be uh, most expected by people uh, and only a few uh, think uh, it will just be marginal. Um, can I ask the panelists to, to respond to this? Maybe maybe I'll start with Andre because I know that uh, that Portum is working on SMR technology and has thoughts about it. So what are your thoughts when you see the results of this poll? Well, uh, it's true that for Atom is having a task force looking at, uh, at, um, at the SMR technologies and uh, looking at the different topics that are uh, impacting this the development deployment of this technology. So we are we are looking at uh, uh, the technology itself, uh, but also on the economic as economic aspects um, uh, and uh, but also licensing and regulatory aspects. It's clear that uh, that uh, SMR is uh, is one of the nuclear technologies that will uh, will develop in the future. And um, just uh, as a joke, I would say that uh, I was foreseeing also uh, the deployment of uh, the development of SMRs uh, from my um, since I was in the university. I was keep telling to my friends that uh, I will work uh, uh, to, to have one uh, in my house, uh, a small SMR in my house because it's <laughs> um, so. Yes, it's it's clear that uh, it will uh, it will respond uh, to some challenges um, um, uh, for the that um, maybe some large reactors are uh, facing right now, like the siting. But it's also um, uh, and also it might uh, bring some uh, good uh, um, good aspects related to the economics. Uh, good. Um, uh, news on the economics of uh, of uh, of the nuclear technology and i think that uh, yes uh, having a, a fleet of smrs uh, complementary to to the large reactor is uh, really the future of um, of the nuclear uh, sector okay thank you does any one of the other panelists want to respond andreas please well um Maybe because I mean you you have heard the support the general support of the commission to the idea of SMRs by our DDG. So I'm not going to uh, say much about this. But um, when we are asked about um, about what we do in our scenarios, um, I think there's two things we need to say. One is um, on one hand, and I think this is true for many models. It uh, does not matter that much uh, whether the uh, on the European level, whether uh, a reactor has, um, uh, which size a reactor has, if you um, look at the over, uh, if you do an overall modeling. So many models are, are blind to that, uh, and, and it doesn't um, necessarily affect the overall economics of your, um, of your energy system. And an energy system would, as a whole, work very, very much the same way whether you deploy a few very large or more smaller reactors. So uh, from an energy economics point of view, this would not make such a difference. There's, there's one difficulty, and this is we already have with the existing nuclear technology, and this is uh, finding the right um, the right par input parameters for our economic modeling. Of course, you all have strong opinions at, at Foratum and, and the members and, and anyone here had probably a strong opinion about how much uh, an investment uh, in, a, in a nuclear power plant costs. But I think we also all know that uh, over time uh, we have often been wrong. We have been wrong in, in, in many directions uh, and uh, 
uh, the problem or the one of the challenges we have is that our assumptions that we need to make in a transparent uh, manner uh, are um, difficult to make already for the existing technology because uh, whatever we assume and you know we have stakeholder workshops to which everyone is uh, uh, invited for Ratum uh, was also always kindly providing us input uh, to that thanks thanks again for this um, but of course uh, we are facing already challenges regarding our, our, our assumptions on on, on current uh, nuclear technology because we know that there's the idea that and I saw this in the in the in the compass lexicon study that you assume some cost reductions. Um, it's clear that this might be possible. Unfortunately, we have seen something else the last 15 years. So um, it's very, very difficult to make a good assumption at all. And I think this will be even worse if we want to model uh, economically the uptake of 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 gen four or, or SMR reactors that that is really not. That, that that is the the only thing um, that that is difficult for us to to do in a transparent manner because I think the uncertainty is is, is still very high. Thank you, Andreas. Any other thoughts from the panel? If if not, I'd like to to go to the next poll, uh, which actually ties nice in to to what uh, what Andre just said. Eh? When you look at the at the different scenarios, obviously, when you look at a high nuclear scenario, uh, there are certain advantages. And the poll was, what is the biggest advantage? And and uh, clearly, the audience think that the climate change benefits are are the the highest uh, advantage for nuclear, but very closely followed there by security of uh, of supply, uh, which we discussed earlier. Uh, and economic advantages. Um, and, um, and and Fabien, I don't want to be uh, putting you on the spot, but what do you think of that last one, the fact that economic advantages are um, uh, scored so low? Fabien? Otherwise, Eve, maybe you can you can comment. Yeah, so, well, I guess it kind of relates back to what uh, Andreas was was mentioning on the uh, uncertainty around the cost assumption and uh, and especially the cost prediction that is uh, that is assumed uh, well in, in our in our different scenarios for, for now. So effectively, the, the cost assumption that we've used assumed that um, um, nuclear cost would reduce over time. So achieving the 37% uh, cost prediction that was uh, presented in the uh, in the in the in the slides, um, so which is effectively um, um, yet to be enacted uh, and 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 proven uh, with the uh, with with all of the necessary uh, improvements that would need to be um, to be implemented on the R and D, the global supply chain, and making sure as well that the 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 new or the or the future um, security type of um, of uh, investment uh, would be done in a in a, an economic manner as well. So I guess all of that uncertainty effectively can um, uh, cast shadows in some ways uh, on the on the economic aspect of the of the nuclear energy in decarbonization. Now, if you consider um, not only so for the other low carbon technologies, if you consider consider not only uh, the LCOE or the cost of investing into variable renewable energy, but you do consider as well all of the costs associated to the necessary short-term or long-term storages. You see that regardless somehow of the of the cost reduction assumption that you could use, uh, nuclear uh, technology would remain competitive. So even at, at the current cost, simply because of uh, all of the necessary additional investment. Uh, that you would need to to incur to make sure that with increasing variable renewable uh, generation, uh, you would maintain the same level of security of supply uh, compared to a scenario with higher share of nuclear. So all in all, that that still remain competitive with effectively uh, maybe a, a higher uh, uh, a dot with regard to cost reduction for nuclear. Maybe I can add a bit and. I think the important point is to understand that for nuclear to be competitive, we need to compare apples with apples. We need to compare what nuclear can provide, which is firm, dependable capacity, uh, 
which is compared to uh, low carbon technologies, which often are intermittent or viable. And, and to compare apples with apples, you really need to factor in the wider system costs, but you also need to factor in the fact that you need to diversify. You cannot put all of your eggs in, in the same basket. And there is a, an option value, if you want, in, in maintaining at least at least uh, a component of the mix that is uh, decarbonized, low carbon, and, and providing on demand, if you want. Thank you for that addition, Fabien. Uh, Cosmin, I saw that you uh, raised your hand. Uh, you want to, uh, to add something? Yes, um, I wanted to say that it's also important, I think, when you, when you talk from an investment point of view, because a lot of the discussions that we're having in the public space is how costly nuclear is and, and whatnot. When we're talking about that, we're just talking about CapEx. And uh, if you're looking at LCOE, for example, in Romania, nuclear right now is probably the second source, the cheapest source of energy. Uh, however, a lot, the largest cost, uh, larger, uh, the, the larger percentage of that cost is CapEx. And it's very CapEx intensive and it, it, it goes over a large period of time, which a lot of your markets and your traditional private investors and what we, you know, uh, we we're, we're used to in the, in the market that you can raise funding for easily is um, is not interested in uh, or was not interested in. We'll we'll see how things evolve. Um, and probably the this heavy government involvement for for large capex is uh, is seen as costly. But I think that if you were to compare LCOE as a, as as everyone looked or. If you look from a total cost of ownership of an energy system, the economic advantages are there, but they are they are relevant at a, such a high level that they don't percolate in the perception of of, uh, of stakeholders, you know, in a tier two or three or or private investors. And I think with the advent of some of these uh, of, of, of modularity in the nuclear technology and uh, and fabrication. Obviously, this can give you a little bit more confidence, speed up uh, production time, and actually uh, allow private markets to 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 reap benefits in their terms as well. Thank thank you very much, and and I think that's that's uh, that's very true. Uh, Andreas, I see you've got your hand up. I yeah, just want to echo uh, Fabian that um, LCOE is uh, not really the metric in uh, in the long term and certainly not in an energy system and also not in an energy system model. So if you see nuclear uh, investments in a situation like our scenarios, this is because the aims are so high that um, and you see this uh, reflected in the carbon price. Um, which in a stylized manner in our long term strategy went, you know, to three to four hundred euro per ton um, that, of course, uh, you need to compare an investment into nuclear power plant to other uh, greenhouse gas mitigation investments that are available. And if you see it from that point of view in the very long term, um, the costs are not such an issue. And it is a misconception about the commission modeling uh, by many lobbyists that by pressing us to lower costs, by 10% of a certain technology, that that would uh, really increase or improve how a certain technology would perform in the long run. And I need to disappoint everyone in the long run, this has not a big impact um, because uh, the, um, the goals that we have in the long run are so important that uh, whether nuclear costs 6,000 euro per kilowatt or, or 5,000 or a bit more than 6,000 or whatever is not affecting too much an investment decision that we try to model in 2050. Today, of course, is another story, but not in, in 2050. And one, one last advertisement, the Commission has, of course, been aware that LCOE is not everything. And you might, some of you might be aware that we publish every two years the energy prices and cost report. And there we have actually been looking at the relationship between how much a technology costs and how much a technology can actually recoup on the market. And uh, Unfortunately for nuclear, there is not really uh, information available on projects that were built recently, so we couldn't really compare. But um, but we are aware of the fact that it's not only how much you pay, but also how much you get out of a technology because you need to sell the, the electricity. Thank you. And, and, and actually, Andreas, I think that answers one of the questions in the uh, in the VVOX. 
uh, which is about the competitive nuclear nuclear energy, uh, where people often uh, refer to the high cost, uh, whereas uh, there are so many more factors that that should be uh, involved and in, uh, which studies are available that you can can use in that debate. Uh, so you've already referred to uh, a, um, a commission paper uh, and. Uh, there will be many others. Uh, I know that that, that Foratom has done a webinar not long ago on a on a Dutch study that looked at LCOE uh, in particular. Um, so uh, th there are uh, various studies available. Um, realizing that we are slowly getting to the end of this uh, of this um, panel discussion, um, and also realizing that that Eve, you you have to lo uh, leave quite soon. Um, I want to ask one final question from all the panelists, and maybe start with you. And that's very much uh, if you look at the pathway to 2050, uh, there are different actors. And, and I think most importantly, you've got the policy makers and the decision makers on, on one hand, and you've got the nuclear industry on the other hand. Uh, if you would have to, uh, a recommendation for each of those parties, uh, one recommendation, uh, what would you ask from regulators uh, to, uh, to do? And what would you ask from nuclear industry to um, maximize their chances of, of really being part of that pathway? Um, so it's it's well kind of uh, echoing one of the conclusions that we had. So it's effectively putting in place a new regulatory regime that would make sure to provide long-term price signal to the different type of investment. Uh, to make sure, as um, as uh, Fabian suggested or ma mentioned, uh, that um, you need to have um, a combination of the different technologies to efficiently decarbonize the power system and not put all of your eggs uh, in the same basket on on one specific technology. So it's really uh, playing on the on the combination and the complementarity of the different technologies that would uh, that would uh, effectively uh, uh, help to drive uh, uh, an efficient uh, and and secure as well uh, decarbonization of the of the power sector and more generally to um, of the of the global European economy. Okay, um, that that was very brief. Uh, Cosmin, if I, if I may ask you the same question. Uh, so what is it you would want uh, from a regulator and what do you think it is that the nuclear industry itself has to offer? So on, on one end, I think that uh, a little bit more relaxation on the on, you know, on um, uh, on on QC bureaucratization and maybe some of these digital exercises that are currently ongoing can definitely help so you can equivalent uh, supply chains and stabilize it more. For example, you can do uh, commercial grades to to military or, uh, um, or oil and gas. So uh, so you can effectively have a, a wider base for, for supply chain when you have production. Secondly, I think that uh, uh, and I'm talking about nuclear regulator and then I'm going to get into energy regulations as well. Uh, the, the 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 second thing that I think is quite important is that if 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 we see more um, a sped up process in uh, in licensing of, of new technologies and uh, and transferring uh, there. Uh, lastly, but definitely not least, for the energy markets and and the energy regulators uh, providing those particular incentives that can uh, definitely um, level the playing field between various classes of clean energy production um, to allow for uh, a good competition based on time of construction, uh, I think would be would be quite beneficial uh, so that um, uh, we're we're also comparing apples to apples in in uh, in the energy grid and we're not providing distortions that could be quite costly to, to the grid itself, but also to the market. So uh, th these would be my recommendations to the two classes of regulators that are involved in the debate. OK, thank you very much, uh, Cosmin. Um, Andreas, can I go to you next? I can only say what I what we would expect from industry or, or, or what, what the perspective would be. I mean, it's a bit difficult to say what we would expect from ourselves. But um, definitely, I mean, from ourselves, I mean, the Commission has been uh, helping to create uh, energy markets and uh, a framework that is um, aiming at achieving uh, energy 
uh, energy and in particular clean energy to be available for all Europeans at best costs. And this is the idea of market, the central idea. So this is why we have created the integrated energy market. It's about getting uh, energy everywhere in Europe at the most favorable cost. And um, of course, while ensuring um, security of supply and while promoting uh, renewable energy and on the transition uh, to greenhouse gas neutral uh, economy. Now, we know that this transition to greenhouse gas neutral economy will rely predominantly on private investments, not on public investments. So the work that we do and the impact assessment that we do, which include partly uh, relying, for which we partly rely on, on quantitative measures, but which also include numerous consultations with stakeholders, are always done in uh, interaction with the actors. So what we do expect is that uh, the actors are um, pursuing these uh, investments and, uh, and, 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 and developing their own strategies in order to um, get on the um, transition path. Because if the actors don't do that, we will have no transition. This is, this is for sure. And uh, the nuclear industry in those member states where they are welcome to contribute to the uh, to this endeavor are no different from any other industry. So basically what we do expect or what is reflected in our assumptions is that the nuclear industry is able to deliver these uh, reinvestments and new investments that are still happening in our scenarios in order to, to get us on the transition path. This is an assumption we make, and this assumption is made based on a number of consultations and, of course, also on numerical uh, quantification, but also on many consultations we had uh, actually actually with you. Thank you very much uh, for, for that insight. Uh, and then last, uh, Andre, um, maybe you can share your thoughts. Yes, my so my thoughts. I mean, uh, we already heard from uh, uh, Eve uh, that uh, the long term perspective is very important, and we also said it uh, in um, in di with different occasions that the long term perspective uh, of uh, with the legislation that to, to support this uh, long term perspective and to incentivize the investments uh, long term investments on the low carbon technology so not only renewable are needed we consider that the clean energy package the the last uh, the last legislative package on the energy market was um, is responding at what ex uh, the, to some extent to this uh, uh, request, but uh, not uh, fully. And we consider that EU ETS um, actually is uh, is the legislative uh, proposal that can make uh, can support very much uh, long term investments in low carbon technologies, and we see uh, good developments. So the uh, high uh, price of the CO2. It's helping this, it's helping um, in thinking about the longer term. Now we can, we, we, we should see how will be the, uh, how this, uh, how stable will be this price and uh, on longer term in order to, um, um, to make the investors thinking about uh, new investment. So all in all, um, yes, this is what, uh, these are our, uh, are our thoughts. We uh, we also took on board what uh, what Andreas said about the industry, but I think that also Eve will say uh, some more things uh, in uh, next. I'll, I will give the, the floor to Eve uh, in a minute, uh, but but first I'd like to to thank all the other panelists for their for their insights, their presentations, and and their honest answers to the questions. Uh, I, I think what we've learned from the various presentations is that uh, the uh, the energy mix in 2050 will look completely different than the energy mix today. Uh, and there are different scenarios, uh, and I think it's encouraging 
for us as the, as, the, as the nuclear industry to see that in many of those scenarios there's a, a large role for nuclear um, but there are uh, large roles for other technologies as well uh, technologies that currently uh, are in their infancy or or need a lot of investment uh, and it will take astronomical uh, investments to to get to any of those scenarios in 2050 uh, and uh, there are many debates ongoing at the moment. Uh, uh, we talked about the taxonomy debate in, in Brussels, uh, which will um, have an impact on what decisions the industry at large will, will make in that road to 2050. Uh, and, and we know that the European Commission is, is driving the, their energy agenda to decarbonize 2050. Uh, and personally, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to see what will happen in the future. And I really hope that this debate has um, has offered a contribution uh, to that uh, to that larger political debate and uh, provided facts and insights that will uh, be helpful. So thank you very much all for your insight. And Eve, with that, I'd like to give the floor back to you for your concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Kisian.